Watergate. The White House called it a third-rate burglary, but it escalated into the worst political scandal in American history. President Richard Nixon, only months after landslide re-election, finds himself haunted by a question that will not go away. What did the president know, and when did he know it? For the first time in the nation's 198-year history, a president resigns his office before his term is over. This is the story of the fall of Richard Milhouse Nixon, of the charges of corruption and cover-up, of high crimes and misdemeanors in the White House, of the battle for the secret tapes that held the proof, of the disgrace of the president's men, and the ultimate triumph of the American system. Through it all, ABC News was there. Watch now the original ABC News broadcast of a great TV news story. Dark Days at the White House, the Watergate scandal, and the resignation of President Richard M. Nixon. From ABC News, great TV news stories with Howard K. Smith, Harry Reisner, Barbara Walters, Ted Koppel, Sam Donaldson, Frank Reynolds, Tom Jarrell, and the worldwide resources of ABC News. Look at this chamber. The leadership of America is here today. The Supreme Court, the Cabinet, the Senate, the House of Representatives. Together, we hold the future of the nation and the conscience of the nation in our hands. Because this year is an election year, it will be a time of great pressure. If we yield to that pressure and fail to deal seriously with the historic challenges that we face, we will have failed the trust of millions of Americans and shaken the confidence they have a right to place in us, in their government. The Democratic National Committee is trying to solve a spy mystery. It began before dawn Saturday when five intruders were captured by police inside the offices of the committee in Washington. The five men carried cameras and apparently had planted electronic bugs. One of them had several crisp new $100 bills in his pocket. The police said they were thoroughly professional. The suspects are saying nothing. The Democrats say they have no idea who would want to spy on them. Mr. Nixon says emphatically that the White House is in no way involved in the burglary and bugging of the Democratic headquarters, and he'll have no further comment on that matter. Mr. Nixon made these points. He admits that overzealous workers in his own re-election committee may have been involved in the Watergate bugging caper. And for the first time, the president admitted that the White House has investigated on its own. And he says that it found no one now employed by his administration to have been involved in any way. The Washington Post reported today that Attorney General Kleindienst, in an interview, pledged a comprehensive, unbiased investigation of the break-in at Democratic National Committee headquarters on June 17th. The Post said Kleindienst promised the most thorough investigation since that of the assassination of President Kennedy. The Washington Post reported today that the FBI has established that high Republican officials had ordered a major political campaign of spying and sabotage against the Democrats to reassure President Nixon's re-election this year. And as part of that campaign, said the Post, the Democratic National Headquarters was bugged with electronic surveillance equipment last June. That was the so-called Watergate affair. But according to the newspaper, that was only one phase of a much more ambitious effort by the Republican hierarchy. Details from ABC's Sam Donaldson. The Post says the espionage operation on the President's behalf was called the Offensive Security Program. It began in 1971, according to the newspaper, and was aimed first at the major contenders for the Democratic presidential nomination. Its goal, infiltration and subversion. The Post reports that a former Treasury Department lawyer, Donald Segretti, attempted to recruit at least three persons as agent provocateurs. Senator George McGovern, campaigning in Detroit, was asked about the new bugging charges, and here's what he had to say. The essential point of this uh, story, as I understand it, is that the uh, Watergate case is a part of a large network of wiretapping of that kind that's been going on. And of course, this is the warning I've been giving about the Watergate thing, that it's not an isolated incident. 
that, that a political agency that will wiretap the uh, headquarters of a national party, they're not going to hesitate to wiretap a businessman or a lawyer or a doctor or a labor leader or a university or even a private home. And this is the thing the American people have to understand about the significance of this Watergate case. November 7, 1972. Despite the Watergate controversy, Richard Nixon is overwhelmingly re-elected to the presidency, winning 49 states to George McGovern's one. The president is at the high point of his political career. But the questions about Watergate will not go away. A total of seven men have been charged in the break-in and face Judge John J. Sirica. The five Watergate burglars, including Nixon campaign security chief James McCord, all arrested in the Watergate building. And two low-level Nixon aides, G. Gordon Liddy and E. Howard Hunt, charged with the planning and execution of the break-in. Some plead guilty, some are convicted. All refuse to implicate higher-ups. The day is February 7, 1973, three weeks into Richard Nixon's second term of office. The Senate tonight voted 77 to nothing to establish a select committee to investigate alleged political espionage in last year's election campaign. That includes the Watergate bugging case. The committee will be headed by North Carolina Democrat Sam Irvin. Watergate defendant James McCord talked with Senate investigators privately twice over the weekend, and today reports of what he may have said are beginning to trickle out. The Los Angeles Times reported today that McCord implicated two Nixon aides in the break-in and attempted bugging of the Democratic National Committee offices in the Watergate. The Times says McCord asserted that former Nixon campaign director Jeb Magruder and White House counsel John Dean both had prior knowledge of the break-in. Magruder today denied all prior knowledge of the incident. Dean personally has not made any public comment, but today the White House swiftly came to his defense. We have a series of reports. First, ABC White House correspondent Bill Gill. The White House stands firm on its claim that John Dean is innocent of any wrongdoing in the Watergate affair. New Secretary Ronald Ziegler placed the president's personal prestige behind Dean's defense. This morning, President Nixon talked to John Dean, and following that conversation, I can again this morning absolutely deny the fact that uh, Mr. Dean had any prior knowledge of the Watergate matter. It's simply a false report. Uh, also this morning, I'm authorized uh, to express, on behalf of the president, total confidence in Mr. Dean, and uh, again to state to you that any report that Mr. Dean had prior knowledge of the Watergate matter is totally false. When the president stepped before reporters late today, the Watergate scandal became a whole new ball game. He first pledged full cooperation with a televised hearing before the Senate Select Committee on Watergate. All members of the White House staff will testify under oath if requested. Then the president dropped the second shoe, saying in effect that he now believes through a subsequent investigation that his previous Watergate investigation conducted by John Dean was full of holes. I can report today that there have been major developments in the case concerning which it would be improper to be more specific now, except to say that real progress has been made in finding the truth. If any person in the executive branch or in the government is indicted by the grand jury, my policy will be to immediately suspend him. If he is convicted, he will, of course, be automatically discharged. I have expressed to the appropriate authorities my view that no individual holding in the past or at present a position of major importance in the administration should be given immunity from prosecution. The judicial process is moving ahead as it should and I shall aid it in all appropriate ways and have so informed the appropriate authorities. As I have said before, and have said throughout this entire matter, all government employees, and especially White House staff employees, are expected fully to cooperate in this matter. I condemn any attempts to cover up in this case, no matter who is involved. According to well-placed White House sources, Jeb Magruder has told all in the Watergate burglary. 
Privately confirming stories carried in today's Washington Post, these sources say that Magruder has told federal investigators that he attended a meeting in the office of then Attorney General John Mitchell in February of last year, where he says the Watergate break-in was plotted by Mitchell, G. Gordon Liddy, and John Dean III, personal counselor to President Nixon. Magruder is alleged to have told investigators that Mitchell also arranged payoffs to the convicted Watergate burglars in attempts to buy their silence. The man in the center of the Watergate swirl here at the White House moved independently of the Oval Office today and issued a statement with the tone of a warning. John Dean acted following overnight news reports leaked from within the White House which pointed an accusing finger at him. The brief written statement says in part, and I quote, some may hope or think that I will become a scapegoat in the Watergate case. Anyone who believes this does not know me, know the true facts, nor understand our system of justice, unquote John Dean. The statement caught White House News Secretary Ron Ziegler by surprise, a tactic with a clear message that Dean is ready to go to reporters himself if news leaks implicating him aren't plugged. Ziegler responded somewhat defensively, saying the president is not trying to find a scapegoat, but is searching for the truth. Ten months and 13 days after it happened, the Watergate affair finally produced some specific actions by the president. Today, he accepted the resignations of three of his closest aides and his attorney general. In no case was there an admission of guilt or even of involvement, but all cases were direct results of Watergate. We have reports first from ABC White House correspondent Tom Jarrell. Out is H.R. Haldeman, chief of staff. The crew-cut, hard-driving former West Coast advertising executive recruited most of the key staff members who implemented the president's daily decisions. As doorkeeper to the Oval Office, Haldeman made many enemies. He claimed he resigned because of various allegations and innuendos raised by the Watergate case, charges, he explained, which had impeded his White House role. Also quitting under fire is John Ehrlichman, chief architect of the administration's domestic programs. When not lambasting Congress for its spending or praising revenue sharing as a concept, Ehrlichman was a key political advisor. He claimed to be victim of unfair public attacks, which he said had left his service to the president damaged, perhaps beyond repair. The initial White House investigator of Watergate, who the president has said gave the staff an all-clear report, John Dean, was fired. Dean is now alleged to have been in on the planning of Watergate and is said ready to implicate Ehrlichman and Haldeman in an attempted cover-up. The easiest course would be for me to blame those to whom I delegated the responsibility to run the campaign. But that would be a cowardly thing to do. I will not place the blame on subordinates, on people whose zeal exceeded their judgment, and who may have done wrong in a cause they deeply believe to be right. In any organization, the man at the top must bear the responsibility. That responsibility, therefore, belongs here, in this office. I accept it. John Dean walked into plain view today about the time the Washington Star News was on the street carrying an interview with him, an interview that told little but hinted at much. Dean reaffirmed his story that he had not prepared the report absolving White House staff of Watergate involvement, which the president attributed to him last August. He told the newspaper's Mary McGrory he was not trying to get the president, and he doesn't think he will, because, Dean is quoted as saying, I am a speck in the cosmos. Look at the power he has. About the president's recent television speech on Watergate, a cosmetic speech, said Dean. But all those tantalizing hints were in the newspaper. In public, on his lawyer's advice, Dean said almost nothing. Right now. Do you feel that you're under a lot of pressure? No. Just very busy. Are you satisfied that whatever course you're taking is the right one for you? Uh, well, I don't really know what you mean by your question, so uh, I'm very uh, busy and indeed doing what I think is right. I think at this point you need the advice of counsel, and the answer is no comment. <laughs> Senate Watergate hearings began in low-key fashion yesterday, but today the senators began getting to the heart of the matter. James W. McCord, Jr., the Watergate conspirator who virtually blew the lid off the case two months ago by vowing to tell all he knew, told his story in public for the first time. ABC's Sam Donaldson reports. 
Now at last, under oath and in public, James McCord, the one-time security director for the committee to re-elect the president, fleshed out the charges alluded to in his letter to the judge. Much of McCord's story had leaked in one form or another, so when the committee began questioning him on the Watergate conspiracy, it came as no surprise to hear the names of former high administration officials. But the high point was yet to come, and McCord made it in a carefully written statement to the committee. Political pressure from the White House was conveyed to me in January 1973 by John Caulfield to remain silent, take executive clemency by going off to prison quietly, and I was told that while there I would receive financial aid and later rehabilitation and a job. I was further told in a January meeting in 1973 with Caulfield that the President of the United States was aware of our meeting, that the results of the meeting would be conveyed to the President, and that a future, at a future meeting there would likely be a personal message from the President himself. There's still another Watergate investigation in the offing, the one to be conducted by a special prosecutor chosen by Attorney General-designate Elliot Richardson. Today, Richardson named the man he has picked for the job. He is Archibald Cox, who served as U.S. Solicitor General during the Kennedy administration. John W. Dean III went before the Senate Watergate Committee today, and as expected, gave the committee names, dates, and places involved in the Watergate affair and its cover-up. Included among those names of, of the names of those having knowledge of the cover-up was Dean's former boss, the President of the United States. We have a full report from ABC's Sam Donaldson. John Dean came with his wife and lawyers, carrying with him an exhaustively detailed, if sometimes ungrammatical, 245-page written statement. But it was not the grammar that shocked the Urban Committee. It was the charge that the President knowingly participated in the Watergate cover-up, a charge Dean put on the record in an almost offhand way at the outset. It is my honest belief that while the president was involved, that he did not realize or appreciate at any time the implications of his involvement. And I think that when the facts come out, I hope the president is forgiven. Dean claimed he didn't know anything about the Watergate break-in until the burglars were caught. He said it came as a complete surprise to him when the president told the nation in late August that Dean's investigation had cleared White House personnel. In fact, said Dean, what he'd been doing during that period was not investigating Watergate, but on Ehrlichman and Haldeman's instructions, covering it up. Then, reading in a dry, toneless style, Dean leveled his first direct charge implicating the president. On September 15th, the Justice Department announced the handing down of seven indictments by the federal grand jury investigating the Watergate. Late that afternoon, I received a call requesting me to come to the president's Oval Office. When I arrived at the Oval Office, I found Mr. Haldeman, the president, and the president. The president asked me to sit down. Both men appeared to be in very good spirits, and my reception was warm and cordial. The president then told me that Bob, referring to Mr. Haldeman, had kept him posted on my handling of the Watergate case. The president told me I had done a good job and he appreciated how difficult a task it had been and the president was pleased that the case had stopped with Liddy. I responded that I could not take credit because others had done much more difficult things than I had done. As the president discussed the, the present status of the situation, I told him that all I'd been able to do was to contain the case and assist in keeping it out of the White House. I also told him that there was a long way to go before this matter would end, and that certainly, I certainly could make no assurances that the day would not come when this matter would not start to unravel. The conversation then moved to the press coverage of the Watergate incident and how the press was really trying to make this into a major campaign issue. At one point in the conversation, I recall the president telling me to keep a good list of the press people giving us trouble because we'll make life difficult for them after the election. Dean claimed that White House efforts were successful in preventing a House committee investigation before the election and in postponing the various civil suits. Dean said he didn't see the president directly again until February of this year. 
Then a series of meetings took place with the president on Watergate, according to Dean, including one on March 13th, a portion of which Dean recalled this way. I told the president about the fact that there were money demands being made by the seven convicted defendants and that the sentencing of these individuals was not far off. It was during this conversation that Haldeman came into the office. After this brief interruption by Haldeman's coming in, but while he was still there, I told the president about the fact that there was no money to pay these individuals to meet their demands. He asked me how much it would cost. I told him I could only make an estimate that it might be as high as a million dollars or more. He told me that that was no problem. He also looked over at Haldeman and repeated the same statement. He then asked me who was demanding this money, and I told him it was principally coming from Hunt through his attorney. The president then referred to the fact that Hunt had been promised executive clemency. He said that he had discussed this matter with Ehrlichman, and contrary to instructions that Ehrlichman had given Colson not to talk to the president about it, that Colson had also discussed it with him later. Dean says that by March 21st, he was convinced the cover-up was falling apart, and he said he met with the president on that day to tell him so, and urged that everyone come clean. I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency, and if the cancer was not removed, the president himself would be killed by it. I also told him that it was important that this cancer be removed immediately because it was growing more deadly every day. I concluded by saying that this is going to take continued perjury and continued support of these individuals for, to perpetuate the cover-up, and I did not believe it was possible to so continue it. Rather, I thought it was time for surgery of the cancer itself, and that all of those involved must stand up and account for themselves, and that the president himself get out in front of this matter. I told the president that I did not believe that all seven defendants would maintain their silence forever. In fact, I thought that one or more would very likely break rank. After I finished, I realized I had not really made the president understand because he asked me a few questions and he discussed that it would be an excellent idea if I gave some sort of briefing to the cabinet and that he was very impressed with my knowledge of the circumstances but not seem particularly concerned with their implications. Dean said that after the March 21st meeting with the president, it seemed to him the White House now considered him the problem. Dean got a lawyer and went to see the federal prosecutors. Then on the evening of April 15th, Dean said he went to see the president. The president almost from the outset began asking me a number of leading questions, which was somewhat unlike his normal conversational relationships I'd had with him, which made me think that the conversation was being taped and a record was being made to protect himself. Although I became aware of this because of the nature of the conversation, I decided I did not know it for a fact and that I had to believe that the president would not tape of such a conversation. Toward the end of the conversation, the president recalled the fact that at one point we had discussed the difficulty of, in raising money and that he said that $1 million was nothing to raise to pay to maintain the silence for the defendants. He said that he, he had, of course, only been joking when he made that comment. As I was on my way out of the office after exchanging parting pleasantries, I told the president that I hoped that my going to the prosecutors and telling the truth would not result in impeachment of the president. He jokingly said, I certainly hope so also. And he said that it would be handled properly. Now it is on the public record, John Dean's damning, if largely unsubstantiated, testimony against the president. Tomorrow, the Urban Committee begins cross-examination of Dean, and it is sure to be fierce, for nothing less than Richard Nixon's presidency may ride on whether the public believes John Dean or not. During seven days in the hospital, the president licked viral pneumonia and came out fighting against the barrage of Watergate problems. To White House employees welcoming him back, Mr. Nixon made his intentions clear. Another bit of advice, too, that I am not going to take, what really is an advice, is I was rather amused by some very well-intentioned people who thought that perhaps the burdens of the office and you know, some of the, of the rather rough uh, assaults that any man in this office gets from time to time uh, brings on an illness. And that uh, after going through such an illness that I might get so tired that uh, I would consider either slowing down or, uh, <laughs> or even some suggested resigning. Well now, uh, just so we set that to rest, I want to use a phrase that my Ohio father used to use. 
any suggestion that this president ever going to slow down while he's president or is ever going to leave this office until he was continues to do the job and finishes the job he was elected to do anyone who suggests that that's just plain poppycock we're going to stay on this job till we get the job done. and what we were elected to do we are going to do and let others wallow in Watergate we're going to do our job The Senate Watergate Committee broke away from its schedule today to hear from a surprise witness, Alexander Butterfield, a former White House aide who now heads the Federal Aviation Administration, appeared before the committee with startling new testimony. We have details from ABC's Sam Donaldson. Alexander Butterfield was one of former White House Chief of Staff Haldeman's top aides until last March 14th. Many of his duties were conventional, but one of them was not. Butterfield said he was in charge of the presidential bugging system. It seemed that in the spring of 1970, President Nixon ordered that certain of his White House offices and certain of his White House telephones be bugged so that everything that was said could be tape recorded. The bugs in the Oval Office and the Executive Office Building hideaway worked automatically. Aaron, would it be your opinion that uh, those devices would pick up any and all conversations, uh, no matter where the conversations took place within the room and no matter how uh, soft the conversations might have been? With regard to the Oval and EOB offices? Yes. yes, sir. Democratic senators on the committee agree tonight the pressure is on the president to produce those tapes or run the grave risk that public opinion will decide he can't because of what is on them. It was only last week that the Senate Watergate Committee learned of the existence of tape recordings of President Nixon's conversations, including conversations bearing on Watergate. The committee immediately asked for those tapes, and today it got its reply, a formal official no. Not only to the Senate investigators, but also to the government's own special Watergate prosecutor, Archibald Cox. That set the stage for what may well be the biggest constitutional confrontation in our history. We have reports first from ABC's David Schumacher at the White House. Few presidential statements have been so widely expected and yet so guaranteed to create shockwaves. Mr. Nixon's final decision to refuse access to the tapes on grounds of separation of powers was made yesterday in a meeting with his new chief of staff, General Alexander Haig, and Ronald Ziegler, both viewed as hardliners in this showdown with Congress. In his letter to Senator Sam Irvin, chairman of the Special Senate Committee, the president admitted that before the existence of the tapes was publicly known, he had listened to them. To quote the president, the tapes are entirely consistent with what I know to be the truth and what I have stated to be the truth. However, they contain comments that persons with different perspectives and motivations would inevitably interpret in different ways. This is a rather remarkable letter about the tapes. If you notice, the president says he's heard the tapes, or some of them, and they sustain his position. But he says he's not going to let anybody else hear them for fear they might draw a different conclusion. I deeply regret that this uh, situation has arisen because I think that the Watergate tragedy is the greatest uh, tragedy this country has ever suffered. I used to think that the Civil War was our country's greatest tragedy, but I do re remember that there were some redeeming features in the Civil War in that there was some spirit of sacrifice and heroism displayed on both sides. I see no redeeming features in Watergate. Mr. Chairman. The pressure continues to build on the president to hand over the White House tapes. Nixon acts decisively. Saturday evening, October 20th, 1973. Nixon orders Attorney General Elliot Richardson to fire Archibald Cox. Richardson refuses and resigns in protest. William Ruckel's house, the Assistant Attorney General, also refuses and is fired by Nixon. Solicitor General Robert Bork finally does the job. Special Prosecutor Cox is fired. His office is sealed by the FBI. These events are dubbed the Saturday Night Massacre. Cox is ultimately replaced by Leon Jaworski.
for the first time since the Watergate case began, talk of presidential impeachment no longer sounds like idle chatter. That's a result of the weekend firing of Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox and the resignations of Attorney General Richardson and his deputy, William Ruckelshaus. We have reports on what is expected tomorrow on Capitol Hill. First, ABC's Bill Zimmerman on the White House side. After the events of the weekend, there is growing sentiment here for the impeachment of the president, though it is doubtful there are now enough votes for it. This resolution will be introduced in the House of Representatives tomorrow by Congressman Jerome Waldy of California. In three articles, it accuses the president of obstructing justice, of violating the mandate of the U.S. Court of Appeals, and of causing the removal of Richardson, Cox, and Ruckelshaus in defiance of promises to Congress. Waldy waved a stack of telegrams, some of the 50,000 reportedly received on the Hill today, heavily favoring impeachment. As he told a news conference, the president has challenged Congress. The president is gambling, gambling that the Congress doesn't have the courage to impeach. I think the president will lose that gamble because I think the people in their anger and outrage will insist upon impeachment. As you must know by now, the president today reversed his stand and after what the White House called painful and agonizing discussions with his advisors, agreed to do just what he had always said he would not do, turn over certain tape recordings of his conversations about Watergate. The tapes will be given to Judge John Sirica, who will then decide what is to be given the grand jury. Uh, I have never heard or seen such outrageous, vicious, distorted reporting in 27 years of public life. I'm not blaming anybody for that. Perhaps what happened is that what we did uh, brought it about, and therefore uh, the media decided that they would have to uh, take that particular line. But when people are pounded night after night uh, with that kind of frantic, hysterical reporting, it naturally shakes their confidence, and yet don't get the impression that you arouse my anger. <laughs> you see, I have that impression. <laughs> you see, one can only be angry with those he respects. <laughs> Mr. President, Mr. President. I have no intention whatever of walking away from the job I was elected to do. As long as I am physically able, I'm going to continue to work 16 to 18 hours a day for the cause of a real peace abroad and for the cause of prosperity without inflation and without war. And I can assure you that no matter what some of my good intentioned friends and certainly I would say honest opponents may suggest to the contrary, I'm not going to walk away till I get that job done. People around me didn't bring things to me that they probably should have because I was frankly just too busy trying to do the nation's business to run the politics. And on that, I say, if mistakes are made, however, I'm not blaming the people down below. The man at the top's got to take the heat for all of them. And I want to say this to the television audience. I made my mistakes, but in all of my years of public life, I have never profited, never profited from public service. I've earned every cent. And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life, that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. The president? Yes, sir. You? you could sense it coming. A grim-faced Judge Sirica had even warned a reporter, you better be there. White House lawyers and the prosecutors had left an in-chambers conference several times during the afternoon to make emergency phone calls. Now, presidential counsel J. Fred Bazart made the announcement. Last week, while preparing an index for the court, we discovered 18 minutes of a June 20th tape contained an audible tone and no conversation. A number of technical tests were made yesterday to discover the reason for the tone, but without satisfactory results. Prosecutor Richard Benvenista quickly promised a thorough investigation and urged, as he put it, in light of the latest revelations, that the court take steps to ensure the safety of the remaining tapes. Judge Sirica, in view of what's happened, this is just another incident which convinces the court it should take some steps. 
not because the court doesn't trust the White House, but the court would feel much better if the president voluntarily surrendered the tapes now. While the details are still being sorted out, it appears the mysterious tone begins in the middle of a conversation between the president and his then chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman. It was the first time the two had a chance to discuss Watergate. And as the original subpoena says, the inference that Haldeman reported on Watergate and received instructions is almost irresistible. Later that same day, the president had his first conversation on the telephone with John Mitchell. And that, as you'll recall, is one of the two missing conversations. So now, on the day the prosecution suspects the Watergate cover-up began, the crucial conversations between the president and his chief aides are missing or partially obliterated. The captain's job to bring that ship into port. And I can assure you that you don't need to worry about my getting seasick or jumping ship. I'm going to stay on that helm till we bring it into port. For the past several weeks, Judge Sirica has had a panel of six electronics experts studying the tape to find out what caused the obliterating hum. Today, their report was released, and they appeared in Sirica's court. ABC's David Schumacher was there. A month ago, Rosemary Woods demonstrated it happened this way, her foot on the recorder floor pedal while stretching for a phone call. Today, her balancing act tumbled to the floor. The experts said it could not possibly have happened this way. It was not the kind of day the president's new lawyer, James Draper St. Clair of Boston, might have chosen for his debut. St. Clair is the latest in what has been a high-risk job defending the president. But friends say he thrives on tough cases. The six-man panel of experts provided him with a considerable challenge. Chosen by the White House and the prosecutors, the experts reported their conclusions were unanimous. The buzz on the tape was the result of at least five and perhaps nine separate erasures. The giveaway was a small electronic fingerprint, three millimeters long, left whenever the recorder was turned off. Presidential lawyer St. Clair jumped to his feet objecting when prosecutor Richard Benvenisti and even Judge Sirica wondered whether the erasures were accidental or deliberate. But Dr. Richard Bolt of Cambridge, Massachusetts dryly agreed if it was an accident, it was an accident repeated five separate and distinct times. When I was elected to that office, I knew that I was elected for the purpose of doing a job and doing it as well as I possibly can. And I want you to know that I have no intention whatever of ever walking away from the job that the people elected me to do for the people of the United States. For only the second time in American history, Congress has passed the point of no return and committed itself to an impeachment investigation of a president of the United States. By an overwhelming vote of 410 to 4, the House of Representatives today gave its Judiciary Committee unqualified powers for an investigation to determine if there are sufficient grounds to impeach President Nixon. Well, a full impeachment trial in the Senate under our Constitution comes only when the House determines that there is an impeachable offense. Uh, it is my belief that the House, after it conducts its inquiry, will not reach that determination. I do not expect to be impeached. March 1st, 1974. The Watergate grand jury indicts Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Mitchell, and two others on charges of covering up the Watergate break-in. Five days later, President Nixon holds a news conference. Mr. President, your attorneys have taken what is seen as the narrow view on impeachment, saying that impeachment should be limited to very serious crimes committed in one's official capacity. And my question is, uh, would you consider the crimes returned in the indictments last week, those of perjury, obstruction of justice, and conspiracy, to be impeachable of crimes if they did apply to you? Well, I've uh, uh, also uh, quit beating my wife. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, the crime of perjury is a serious crime. And of course, the crime of obstruction of justice is a serious crime and would be an impeachable offense. And uh, I do not expect that the House Committee will find that the President is guilty of uh, any of these crimes to which you have referred. 
uh, when you refer to a narrow view of what is an impeachable crime, I would say that what might leave in the minds of some of our viewers and listeners uh, a connotation of uh, which uh, would be inaccurate. It's the constitutional view. Uh, the constitutional is very precise. Even Senator Irvin agrees uh, that that view is the right one. And if Senator Irvin agrees, it must be the right one. The House Judiciary Committee on Impeachment subpoenas the White House tapes on April 11th. On April 29, 1974, Nixon, saying the tapes will clear him, agrees to turn over transcripts of the tapes, but not the tapes themselves. The released transcripts contain many passages marked unintelligible and expletive deleted. The day is May 1st, 1974. President Nixon created a massive media event yesterday with his release of edited transcripts of the White House conversations. Today, Washington has been a city waiting for several other shoes to drop. The material represents only 31 of the 42 conversations subpoenaed by the House Judiciary Committee and only 20 of 64 conversations subpoenaed by Special Prosecutor Jaworski. The Judiciary Committee meets tonight to consider its next move, and ABC's Sam Donaldson has more on that story. The Judiciary Committee is sharply divided along party lines in advance of tonight's meeting. The Democrats wanting the committee to make it clear the President has not complied with the subpoena. I think we, we must make an official position, take an official position as to uh, what has happened, and that is inevitably going to establish that in the minds of the committee members he's not complied with the subpoena, has not satisfied its requirements. We need those tapes. Obviously, reading the transcripts, so many things are deemed to be inaudible, so many things are dropped, so many uh, unexplained omissions that one can't really piece together the story. We simply have been denied the basic evidence that we need. I personally feel the president is not in compliance. I think it is an evident fact he is not in compliance. Beyond some assertion to that effect, uh, we can do little else than to proceed with the inquiry the factual presentation as promptly as possible, notwithstanding the fact that certain evidence is not available because uh, the White House has not produced it for us. Weighted by the historic burden of their task, members of the House Judiciary Committee today solemnly opened hearings on the impeachment evidence against President Nixon. ABC's Sam Donaldson reports. <laughs> One more now. It was just after 1 p.m. when Chairman Rodino gaveled his committee into history, all but one of the 38 members present. Committee counsel John Doerr and Albert Jenner sat ready to present the case, focusing today on Watergate. The president's lawyer, James St. Clair, was present today as an observer only. Later, he'll become an active participant. The chairman and the senior Republican set the tone for the hearings. I don't need to stress again the importance of our undertaking and the wisdom decency and principle which we must bring to it. We understand our high constitutional responsibility. We will faithfully live up to it. For some time, we have known that the real security of this nation lies in the integrity of its institutions and the trust and informed confidence of its people. We conduct our deliberations in that spirit. June 10, 1974. President Nixon leaves the U.S. for the Middle East, where he is welcomed as a hero. Five days after returning home, Nixon travels to Russia, where he demonstrates his close personal friendship with Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev. When Nixon returns home, what some call impeachment diplomacy does him little good. The day is July 24, 1974. In a ruling that bears on the limits of presidential power, the Supreme Court said today that President Nixon must surrender more Watergate tapes. 64 tapes sought by the special prosecutor for the Watergate cover-up trial were ordered turned over to Judge Sirica to determine what evidence there is relevant. The decision was unanimous, eight justices in concurrence, the ninth William Rehnquist having disqualified himself from the case. Time had run out for seeking evidence, measuring the facts, struggling with conscience. Time now to decide. The committee will be in order, and pursuant to the rule, we will proceed to the consideration of the 
Opposed articles of impeachment. Resolved that Richard M. Nixon, President of the United States, is impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors, and that the following articles of impeachment be exhibited to the Senate. Article 1. In his conduct of the office of President of the United States, Richard M. Nixon, in violation of his constitutional oath, faithfully to execute the office of President of the United States, and to the best of his ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, and in violation of his constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, has prevented, obstructed, and impeded the administration of justice. Obstruction of justice in the Watergate burglary, Article 1, offered today by Democrat Paul Sarbanes of Maryland, but the result of consultations among Democrats and impeachment-minded Republicans. No charge that the president ordered the burglary, but the charge that the president ordered and aided in its cover-up. Article 1 says this presidential policy was implemented in nine ways. First, by making false statements to official investigators. Second, by withholding evidence from official investigators. Third, by approving and condoning perjury. Fourth, by impeding the investigations of the Department of Justice, FBI, and the special prosecutor. Fifth, by approving and condoning the payment of money to buy silence or influence testimony. Sixth, by endeavoring to misuse the CIA. Seventh, by telling suspects what prosecutors had on them for the purpose of helping them to avoid criminal liability. Eighth, by making false public statements in order to deceive the American people about White House involvement. And ninth, by trying to make criminal defendants think they could expect favored treatment if they remain silent or lied. Aye. 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 No. 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 I. No. No. I. No. I. 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 No. I. No. 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 Mr. Rodino. I. 27 members have voted aye. 11 members have voted no. And pursuant to the resolution, Article 1, that resolution is adopted and will be reported to the House. And so it had happened for the first time in 107 years. A committee of the House had recommended the impeachment and removal from office by the Senate of a president. There was no dancing in the aisles. An opponent of impeachment, sensing the outcome, had warned his colleagues, you will have to live with your conscience. In the end, each member seemed satisfied to do that. On July 30th, 1974, the House Judiciary Committee completes its work. Three articles of impeachment are approved. Article 1 charges Richard Nixon with obstruction of justice. Article 2 charges abuse of presidential power. Article 3 charges the president with attempting to impede the impeachment process by defying committee subpoenas for evidence. The Senate can now hold a formal trial of the president of the United States. The day is July 31st, 1974. Yesterday, White House attorney James St. Clair turned over 20 new presidential tapes to federal judge Sirica. Today, St. Clair provided a detailed index and analysis of the tapes in which President Nixon claimed executive privilege on some 48 minutes of conversation. In addition, the analysis showed five minutes and 12 seconds of one conversation is missing because, according to the White House, the tape ran out. The missing segment is in a conversation between the president and his aides Haldeman and Ehrlichman on April the 17th, 1973. That was the day when the president said publicly he had begun a new Watergate investigation because of, quote, serious charges. There were 13 more tape recordings in the batch of material turned over to Judge Sirica today by the president's lawyers. That brings to 33, the number handed over since last week's Supreme Court ruling upholding Sirica's subpoena for the material. President Nixon has released the transcripts of three more Watergate tape recordings, which he says may be damaging to his case against impeachment and removal from office. All three transcripts cover conversations between the president and White House Chief of Staff H.R. Haldeman only six days after the Watergate break-in. 
The president admits the transcripts contradict his own Watergate statements and says he is turning them over to the House Judiciary Committee and to the Senate. This is David Schumacher. Like those transcripts released earlier, the conversations released today are dotted with the frequent notation, unintelligible. The transcripts were released on our deadline. This report is based on a very hurried reading. All three are conversations between the president and his chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman. It is Haldeman who opens the first conversation, and I'm quoting. Now, on the investigation, you know, the Democratic break-in thing, we're back in the problem area because the FBI is under control because Gray doesn't exactly know how to control it. And their investigation is now leading into some productive areas, and, and it goes in some directions we don't want it to go. Haldeman then recommends that the CIA be called in to tell then-FBI Director Pat Gray to say, quote, stay to hell out of this. The president is worried about how to handle Howard Hunt. Hunt, and I'm quoting the president, that will uncover a lot of things. You open that scab, there's a hell of a lot of things that we just fell that it would be very detrimental to have this thing go any further. This involves these Cubans, Hunt, and a lot of hanky-panky that we have nothing to do with ourselves. Well, what the hell? Did Mitchell know about this? Haldeman answers, I think so. I don't think he knew the details, but I think he knew. Later, the president, after a discussion about G. Gordon Liddy and how the Watergate burglars were financed, says, all right, fine, I understand it all. We won't second-guess Mitchell and the rest. Later, in this conversation, the president of this conversation, the president was to say in a television broadcast, I was not aware of any efforts to limit or impede the FBI investigation. Tonight, the world waits to hear from President Nixon. At 9 o'clock Washington time tonight, Mr. Nixon will deliver a live televised address from the Oval Office of the White House. All indications are that he will announce his resignation as the 37th president of the United States. Howard? Tonight, the president will tell the American people what he alone can tell them, why, if it is so, his persistent resolve never to resign his office has now been changed. In Washington today, the mood of expectation that the president would step down changed radically to one of almost certainty. One White House aide even confirmed it, but refused to let his name be used. On Capitol Hill, Democratic House Whip Thomas O'Neill said that Gerald Ford will be sworn in as president tomorrow afternoon. Still, the final word will come from Mr. Nixon himself in his broadcast tonight, perhaps his last from the White House. That's where today's drama began. ABC White House correspondent Tom Jarrell has details. As the president arrived at his office today, he began implementing the steps which will lead to his departure. Vice President Ford was summoned for an hour, ten minute discussion on how to handle an orderly transition. The starch was gone from new Secretary Ronald Ziegler as he gave what may be his last official announcement. Tonight at 9 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, the President of the United States will address the nation on radio and television from his Oval Office. Ziegler turned quickly and left, neither taking questions nor waiting for the traditional thank you to formally end the news conference. Reporters who had observed him and engaged in verbal combat over the years felt Ziegler's appearance confirmed the resignation reports. Aides privately said yes, they were true, but would not give details. The official announcement is being left for the president. The pressure built quickly and became unbearable when both Republicans in Congress and some senior White House staff members demanded he quit. The final decision came after Mr. Nixon dined with his family last night, following a lengthy discussion with Secretary of State Kissinger. First thing today, ABC's Ted Koppel found the secretary in a somber mood, as Kissinger recalled the previous evening. What were you doing there so long last night? Well, the president called me and asked me to come by, and uh, so I spent some hours with him. Were you discussing foreign policy, or were you discussing resignation? We were discussing the whole situation. Uh, we've gone through uh, many difficult periods together, and he wanted to exchange some views. Now, one word, Mr. Secretary, has been used to describe the President's mood by at least <clears throat> two different people who have seen him over the past few days, and that is serene. How would you describe it? I would call it philosophical and, and serene and reflective. Good evening. This is the 37th time I have spoken to you from this office where so many decisions have been made that shape the history of this nation. Each time I have done so to discuss with you some matter that I believe affected the national interest. In all the decisions I have made in my public life, I have always tried 
to do what was best for the nation. Throughout the long and difficult period of Watergate, I have felt it was my duty to persevere, to make every possible effort to complete the term of office to which you elected me. In the past few days, however, it has become evident to me that I no longer have a strong enough political base in the Congress to justify continuing that effort. I would have preferred to carry through to the finish whatever the personal agony it would have involved. And my family unanimously urged me to do so. But the interests of the nation must always come before any personal considerations. From the discussions I have had with congressional and other leaders, I have concluded that because of the Watergate matter, I might not have the support of the Congress that I would consider necessary to back the very difficult decisions and carry out the duties of this office in the way the interests of the nation will require. I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. America needs a full-time president and a full-time Congress, particularly at this time with problems we face at home and abroad. To continue to fight through the months ahead for my personal vindication would almost totally absorb the time and attention of both the president and the Congress in a period when our entire focus should be on the great issues of peace abroad and prosperity without inflation at home. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. We leave proud of the people who have stood by us and worked for us and served this country. We want you to be proud of what you've done. We want you to continue to serve in government, if that is your wish. Always give your best. Never get discouraged. Never be petty. Always remember, others may hate you. Those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. President and Mrs. Nixon, Vice President Gerald Ford, soon to be president, and Mrs. Ford walking the red carpet now down to the helicopter. Sustained applause. They're followed by Tricia Nixon and Ed Cox, Julie and David Eisenhower. Ron Ziegler was one of the first ones out the door. Dr. Walter Takash walking out to the plane. They are now boarding the helicopter, walking through the honor guard, as you can see. The president glanced this way at the press, standing on the platform briefly, half smile on his face as he walked by. There are tearful goodbyes now at the helicopter because Julie Nixon Eisenhower and her husband David will not be boarding the helicopter. They will be not be boarding Air Force One to fly to San Clemente today. The president now at the door. A final wave. Ninety minutes before Richard Nixon's resignation becomes effective, Gerald Ford takes the oath of office as the 38th President of the United States. My fellow Americans, our long national nightmare is over. Our Constitution works. Richard Nixon is now subject to arrest and trial as a private citizen. But on September 8, 1974, President Ford grants him a full pardon. 
Nixon enters a long period of exile from public life, but re-emerges in the late 1970s. In a rare live appearance on ABC's 2020, Richard Nixon spoke with Barbara Walters. I've never judged myself, but since you've asked about politics, perhaps I can tell you about that. Uh, I retired from politics uh, six years ago. Uh, but while I've retired from politics, uh, I haven't retired from life. And perhaps I can best characterize myself by saying that uh, while recalling one of the most moving uh, speeches I ever heard, and I think you may have heard it too, uh, in the Congress of the United States when Douglas MacArthur was fired by Harry Truman. And he closed the speech by saying, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. And I would paraphrase that, uh, and this applies to me, that uh, old politicians usually die, but they never fade away. Thank you.